Dr. Justin Frank takes us deep inside the psychology of authoritarianism and Donald Trump. Check it out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. This is our old buddy, Dr. Justin Frank, the psychoanalyst and clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., the author of Trump on the Couch, as well as Obama and Bush on the Couch. Uh, his Twitter handle is JustinFrankMD, spelled just like it sounds. Dr. Frank, welcome back. I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us a... Uh, uh, a basic understanding of the psychology of authoritarianism. Well, first of all, the psychology of authoritarianism begins in childhood, where the child internalizes powerful parental figures and makes them part of themselves. And one way of thinking about those internal figures, like, for instance, of a father or a mother, is that they can be called totalitarian objects or totalitarian parts of the self. And so what happens in childhood is that, for instance, during toilet training, if you have a very cruel mother or even a normal mother, you may experience that person as demanding and like a totalitarian person who insists that you go in the toilet and not in a diaper. So over time, a child internalizes these uh, totalitarian figures, and we all have them. We all have them. So the authoritarian personality, in a way, begins at home in all of us. When our parents are about five or six, when we were about five or six, our parents, when we were about five or six, our parents become uh, people that we can see in perspective. We meet teachers, we meet other adults, and so we get a little bit, uh, at times, either disillusioned or have perspectives. But the, the totalitarian object persists and exists inside of us. And that object has certain qualities that are very important fundamental qualities because the totalitarian object affects our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. So we all have that. We learn about not making a scene when we're adults or when we're a kid. We learn about controlling our actions. We learn about not doing this, not doing that. A lot of negatives. But a totalitarian object that's inside of us is the precursor for authoritarianism. People who, How in terms of Donald Trump, hello, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. I thought you had finished your. your no, you go ahead. Uh, I'm finished. Well, oh, how, how do how does that tie into uh, fear? You know, generalized anxiety or generalized fear or or a sense of lack of control. Um, you know, I, 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 I've read, you know, articles, literature, whatever, suggesting, for example, that Hitler's child rearing techniques of, you know, beat your children, basically, um, led to a totalitarian mindset among German people who grew up during that era. Um, it, 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 does, is that all tied into what you were just describing? And is that real? Yes, it is real. I mean, there's a, there are cool parents who dominate and, it, and then the child internalizes that as an internal totalitarian object. So for instance, in the case of Donald Trump, his father was very much of a tyrant. Fred Trump controlled everything in the family, made everybody come to dinner at 6.30, uh, had people sit in certain places, don't make, them, don't make any mistakes. He was very tyrannical. Donald Trump internalized that figure. And part of the reason you internalize it is because it's what you know, but part of it is to protect yourself. Because if you can identify with the person who's potentially injuring you, you can become, in your mind, stronger and more competent and more able to stand up to that figure. So Trump became very much of a mirror of his father as a totalitarian and as an authoritarian. But uh, so I don't know if that's... Yeah, no, I think it's brilliant. How does that 
uh, tie into the people who are going to be showing up in Washington, D.C. tomorrow, um, and they're trying to figure out how to smuggle guns into town and all this kind of stuff. Um, what what well, brings about that kind of a personality or mentality? All those people have this a similar kind of authoritarian figure and inside. We all do. You and I, even, as nice as we are, uh, we have some of that inside of us. And so what happened with Trump is that he tapped into people's resentment and rage and in an authoritarian way made people feel understood, known, accepted, and they became devoted to him. Just like he said, he could walk down Main Street and shoot somebody and he wouldn't lose any votes and gain votes because he is an authoritarian figure who you feel protected by. What he did probably, what I, the way I think about it is that a father, when his child is two or three, tells a terrible, frightening story to the kid and puts him to bed and the kid is scared to death. And then he has nightmares and screams, and the father comes in and turns out on the light and says, I will help you, I will protect you. He's done the whole mm. thing. He scared the person, and then he's rescued the person. Instead of what a healthier father would do is say, here's a flashlight. Next time you have a nightmare, turn it on yourself, and you can take care of your nightmares. But it's a t everybody yearns for some kind of totalitarian figure when uh, we are uh, frightened, scared, feeling helpless and powerless. And the combination that Trump has had in, in, uh, in his functioning as president is that he is a totalitarian figure who is also, as people have described, a malignant narcissist. Well, people who are narcissists have to see themselves mirrored. So the people who follow him feel that they're very similar to him and they identify with him. And he also insists on imposing himself into their minds, and into their being. So when he has rallies, there's a reverberation of mirroring process. And it's not even clear who's who sometimes. Is it Trump or is it the, the, his base who is re responding to him? It's like there's a shared unconscious totalitarian figure. So the people who are coming into D.C. tomorrow are essentially deeply identified with him. The other thing that a totalitarian figure can do, and Trump is one who does, is he can give you permission to be cruel and to be violent. So the, all presidents function to some extent as a superego figure or as a father figure. And usually they help you manage your behavior, control your impulses, manage your anxiety. So Obama would try to help calm us down so we'd be less anxious about the turmoil that existed in the world. Uh, Reagan did the same thing. Other presidents do that. Whereas Trump does not do that. He says, I'm in charge. I can fix it. And he is the person uh, who essentially does everything. And he is the ultimate totalitarian figure. So he gives permission to the rest of us to be nasty or to be violent. He says, lock them up and go ahead and beat up the person in his rallies. This is giving permission for the totalitarian figure in all of us, or at least in those in his base, to emerge and feel that they can express themselves. And that's what I think has been happening in this country. And it's very disturbing. And, and welcome back. So, Dr. Frank, uh, when our when our commercial stations rejoin us in four minutes, although we're still live on our non-commercial non stations, I, I'd like to get into the, the societal aspect of this and what do we do about it. But I, I saw something the other day that I, I thought gave me an insight into the Trump family and, I'm, and, and, and that, that may hold lessons with regard to this whole thing. I don't know if you saw this clip of Don Jr. where uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle, his girlfriend, was standing there with him and they asked him a question about her and he made some depreciating or even derogatory remarks about her and then kind of joked saying, you know, you've got to keep them off balance or you've got to put them in their place from time to time, otherwise they don't really love you. 
Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm doing this from memory. I don't have the quotes in front of me, but it was essentially words to that effect. And I remember thinking, I'll bet this is how his father raised him, that he would trash him in front of other people. And I wonder what this is doing to Kimberly Guilfoyle, first of all. And, and number two, I wonder what it is telling the people who are followers of Don Jr. And, and number three, you know, where did this come from? I mean, I've literally, uh, I think maybe only one other time in my life have I seen that kind of dynamic in a couple that was, you know, that, that I could see interacting that way. Well, first of all, uh, the behavior of Don Jr. is very much like his father. And it not only is uh, a power position, it's a defensive use of contempt towards women. And part of that has to do with a deep unconscious fear of one's own mother or of women. In fact, Trump wrote about it in a couple of his books that women really are much more powerful than men. And he said that in several different books. And it has to do with the power for him of their sexuality. But I think it's the power of the fact that they can invite a person to need them. And a powerful autocrat is against needing anybody. The unconscious part is that he has to be mirrored all the time. So that's the first thing. Uh, it is one of the characteristics of the totalitarian figure is that they don't respect boundaries. So they don't respect the individual boundaries of the other person because the other person has to do whatever they want. So they don't have compassion, as we've seen with Trump, but they also insist on total obedience and loyalty. And it has to do with a fear of differentiation, that if the person you're controlling is at all different from you, they might revolt and rebel against you. So they have to constantly do things exactly the way you want to, want them to. So they become totalitarian in a way that is very... Uh, controlling and demanding to the extent that you actually, a malignant narcissist and totalitarian, begins to try to take over the other person's mind. So it inhibits or eliminates maturation. It eliminates curiosity, the capacity to differentiate or it all become a separate person. Psychologically, you have to be the same. And Trump has never changed from that. Align with us. Uh, the author of Trump on the Couch, uh, his Twitter handle, Justin Frank, MD. Uh, Dr. Frank, what do we do about this at the level of society, um, at the level of culture? I mean, do, how do we, how do we, I, I, I'm, I'm lacking words here. How do we awaken America to the danger of authoritarian leadership? I guess that's the essence of my question. And how do we purge this, this poison out of our system that has, uh, so infected our country over the last five years? Well, the poison is real. But the problem with the poison is it's going to linger after Trump leaves. And that's what you're asking about and talking about. Because it is going to linger. And there is an authoritarian part in all of us. One of the great things about an authoritarian figure, even though they're mostly bad and negative, is that you can feel protected and safe, but also you don't have to do, once you decide not to be an individual and to be a me too kind of follower, you don't have to think. You don't have to make decisions on this kind of a level. So actually, there are some people who talk about in England, and I've been quite influenced by their thinking, uh, the attra unconscious attraction to non-thought that we all have, which is that we're attracted to not having to do the work of thinking, which fits exactly with the needs of an authoritarian figure who wants to control our ability to think. So the attraction is that we don't have to do work. We don't have to risk being attacked for our individual thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of attraction. That's why people categorize people. People talk about me as, oh, the shrink is talking. You know, or all oh, the economists who doesn't know anything is talking or, you know, they categorize people in, by race, by gender, all kinds of ways of not just projecting and paranoid anxiety, but managing anxiety so they don't have to think about the other people as individuals. 
And what Trump's done with the poison is he's activated that part of all of us. And the only way I think we can ever get through this is, A, to prosecute Trump after he leaves office. We have to make people accountable and make it open. But the second is we have to look at our own position of welcoming him and embracing him. And I don't just mean his followers. I mean people in the media who always give him the benefit of the doubt for so long, for four, three or four years, in fact. We have to look at the fact that there's a part of him that makes us feel comfortable. We can talk about his lying. And everybody lists all of his lies. And that makes us feel superior and how bad he is. But that's a form of not having to think about what the lies are. And the issue is, how can we think about what the lies are? And that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, and I think that one of the great things about a great things, one of the powerful things about a narcissistic leader is that they don't allow you space to think. So that really fits with our own attraction to not having to think. So they don't allow us space to think because they don't want us to be individuated. And we are, there's a part of us that's comfortable with that. And that causes a big problem that we're going to have to work on where people have to recognize their participation in enabling this, uh, this man as a president to do these things. One of the ways that he does... Dr. Frank, we... To, Okay. No, finish your thought. My, my apologies. We have a one of the here. ways he does, one of the things he has in his, in his arsenal is all the tweeting. What tweeting does in a massive way is it interferes with our ability to think because we're constantly bombarded. So we have no time to sit and think about a particular tweet because more are coming. And that's exactly a technique that an authoritarian dictator has and that a malignant narcissist has. And it's a brilliant technique, but we comply with it. I'll stop there. We, yeah, OK, we just have one minute left. Um, how is this different from breaking up with a cult leader? Isn't, don't we need cult deprogramming? Yes, but we don't need to, we can't deprogram ourselves unless we learn how we have been programmed and part of the programming is something of our own making because we do have an internal yearning for somebody to protect us and make us feel safe. That's part of being a child. And um, that part doesn't go away. So I think that it's not so much deprogramming as facing who we are. And that's going to be a hard thing to do because it requires uh, a lot of work on the part of teachers, on the part of educators, on the part of uh, the media to help us start taking responsibility for how we've contributed to this. I used to talk about all of us have some version of an inner Trump, and we all do in some ways, except maybe for you, Tom. I don't know, but I mean, but uh, you all do. <laughs> I, I have no exception. Uh, Dr. Frank, it's always great talking with you. Thank, thank you so much for dropping by today. Thank you.